Hi, I'm here with my friend Anne-Marie Wilson, um, who's one of TFUN's Inspired Individuals. Um, Anne-Marie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do and your organisation? Well, I set up an organisation called 28 Too Many that I established in 2012, but I've been actually running this as a project since 2010. And it came about because I met a little girl in 2005 who'd had FGM, female genital mutilation, when I was working in West R4. And she had this procedure at five years old and I met her at 10 after she'd been raped and had a baby. And were it not for the clinic I was working in, she would have lost her life. And I just thought, I want to stand in the stead for girls like this to speak up on their behalf because they are voiceless and I wanted to have um, an attempt at helping to end female genital mutilation across Africa which actually affects 3 million girls a year so unless we do something now there will be 30 million girls affected in the next decade one every 10 seconds Sure. just trying to take that in one every 10 seconds so if this video is a couple of minutes long it means we're talking 180 girls in the next three minutes I think it works out at something like um, six girls, one, one girl every ten seconds. One girl every six ten, girls six girls every, so eighteen girls. Oh, anyway. I, I talked a, a week or so ago for an hour and a half, and it was five hundred and sixty affected in that hour and a half's talk. So sure. it is a shocking statistic. So, what does twenty eight too many stand for? It's uh, we we called it that because of the twenty eight countries that are affected by FGM, and in my view, it is twenty eight too many. However, it's a deceptive figure in as much as there are more, probably about 40, mm -hmm. but the WHO cites, cites anything uh, over about 5% of the population as one of those top 28. There are also increasing reports of FGM affecting a large proportion of the Middle East, Iraqi Kurdistan at the moment, parts of Malaysia and Indonesia, and of course all the diaspora where people settle from one of those 28 countries and still carry on the practice. Um. So, so we're talking about um, a, a percentage of the population who, who would who would then have FGM, be victims of FGM. That's right. Um, so in South Africa, um, we read an article this morning which mm -hmm. talks about um, women from the Vendor tribe mm -hmm. who would be victims of, mm -hmm. of FGM. And then of course in an area like Hilbra where we're 77% foreigners, yes. we'd have people coming from your various African countries um, who also would, would practice it and perhaps even practice it in South Africa. Almost oh, definitely. And certainly in the UK I come from London and that also has a high proportion of um, migrants and certainly we know for a fact that Somalis um, practice it to a to level of about 98% of their population and generally carry on that practice wherever they go and settle in the planet. So that means if you've got Somalis living in South Africa, there'd be a very high chance they would be practicing. And we know in our urban centres in the UK, Birmingham, Manchester, London, there's definitely practices of it because we know from the evidence. I'm, I'm going to ask the very terrible question that I don't like to ask, but could you maybe <laughs> describe for us a little bit about what, what is FGM, what are the types of FGM, um, and maybe just a bit about the impact on women mm. and men, um, mm. the negative impacts? Mm, sure. Well, FGM ha is classed by the WHO as four different types. The first type is a clitoridectomy, which probably will leave your viewers understanding exactly what I'm talking about, but the clitoris is, cut, is removed, cut out. Um, the second type, and these are all cumulative, so the second type is the labia minora and the clitoris are removed. The third type is the labia majora and the labia minora and the clitoris are removed. And by the very nature that leaves such a large hole or orifice, open wound, it needs to be sutured. And where we are at the moment in Kenya, they use the long acacia thorns to suture and cat gut to stitch the girl up to leave a, a, a very small orifice the size of a grain of rice. They'll put a grain of rice in to keep her slightly open after she heals, just enough for um, menses to pass urine to trickle out, but it'll take 15 minutes for her to pass urine. And of course it leaves a complete um, unfit um, place for her to um, consummate a marriage or indeed have a baby. And these are often called the three sorrows of a girl's life, a woman's life. The day of FGM, the day of having a baby and the day of um, consummating a marriage. So what are some of the, the health effects of that for, for women in particular? 
Well, I talked about 3 million girls who are cut a year. It's actually 125 to 140 million girls in, in the country, in the world at the moment, have had FGM. So you will be frequently meeting people affected by this procedure. But in terms of them having it, um, it it's likely to be 10% will die immediately of haemorrhage. But because that brings a lot of um, stigma to the family, um, they will just get rid of the body and it will be as if that child never existed. The mother isn't even allowed to grieve properly. But for those that do survive, often she will get um, septicemia, she'll get tetanus, she'll get um, infections going up her fallopian tubes, which actually leaves her sterile, which completely defeats the object of a woman bring, being fertile. And um, having children, which generally will mean she will be divorced by her husband and in the case of um, living to have a baby and perhaps losing the baby through to a long complicated um, labour, she will often get fistula which is incontinent singly or doubly and then often again her husband will divorce her because she will stink of faeces or urine that will trickle constantly. Mm and then she will just be abandoned by her family because the family won't have the money to return the dowry price. So this woman will just be abandoned and have no occupation. Wow. So this is really is a horrific form of child abuse. I feel it is. I mean, it really, even the survivors of this uh, give permission for it to be called abuse now. It used to be called a cultural practice. And while it's called a cultural practice, of course it endures. My view is that culture has some great things about it, but it has some very bad things. And I, I believe we should keep the good part and abandon yeah. the bad. Now, why is it so hidden? Well, I think it's it's linked in with patriarchy, that actually it, it's, on a lot of levels, kids keeps the men in power, disempowering the girls from having completed their education. Um, men have the upper hand, if you like, in terms of money and make the decisions. And the... They make the, the decision on their child being given a dowry and married off at 10 or 12 years old. Um, and there are all sorts of myths and legends that go along with that. Actually, I worked in a Somali refugee camp and once the men had actually started having sexual relations with um, women from a different part of the community from their own, say Sudanese or um, Zambian perhaps, um, Ugandan, they would actually find the sexual experience of a wo an uncut woman very different and mm. much more pleasurable. So by the very nature of having poor marital relations, this actually also causes all sorts of marital problems, really. Wow. So there's incentive for men to actually change this practice, too. There's no religious affiliation. There's no, for example, in the Quran or in the Torah or in the Bible or any other religious books, are there mentions no, of this practice? Absolutely not. In the, in, the, in the Quran, there's a weak hadith, so it's not even in the Quran, but one of the sayings of the Prophet, that, that is, des is is agreed to be weak, so it's um, instead of the oral history being broken, it's uh, unbroken, it's broken, and it's very weak, and it just talks about the prophet talking to a circumciser and saying, um, when you cut, don't cut too deeply, but that's the only mention of it at all. Mm. It would have been cultural at that time, but it's not a requirement. Mm. Um, what do you think that... Um we could do about it in our community in Hillbrow, mm. in communities like ours where many people from foreign countries live, um, clinics, what, what, what yeah. sort of role could, could we play? What's mm. I think everybody watching this video clip has a role to play actually. I think it's a case of being aware of our diversity of our neighbours. I think we have a duty on protecting children mm. who are vulnerable by the very nature of their, they have li limited rights. Um, I don't think any child in South Africa should be um, subjected to this practice. So that means making sure the law is known about. And in fact, we've upheld. got our Children's Act, which, which forbids it. So there we do are. have the Children's Act, and we've also got some other legislation which deals with it. Um, but it is it is a forbidden practice, and mm -hmm. I would suspect it would also be unconstitutional. And I think so. Yeah. So the fact is, it, it's you've got you've passed the first test; it's in the law. <laughs> then we've got to talk about whether it's being upheld in the law by um, police officers and the judiciary. Then we've got to talk about whether the teachers in schools know about this, so that if a girl comes to them mm. and asks for protection, it's known. Your border agencies need to be aware of people going out of country for the long yeah. summer holidays back to their home country which is where it may happen. 
we've also got to make sure that health practitioners are aware of it and report it yeah. as abuse but also women have to um, we need to advocate for women to have health facilities that meet their needs African women's centers that could carry out a procedure of de-infibulation where they could be open slightly to mm. ease their their problems and also they can get proper maternity care that meets their needs because a girl presenting in um, at a full term labor would um, give a very complicated scenario to a midwife without yeah. proper training. Um, to get more information, mm -hmm. where, would, um, where would people go to get more information? Yes, yeah, so we're always helpful, ha happy to help whatever the question really. We've got our website www.28, that's the numbers 28, too many, T -O -O -M -A -N -Y org. We'll always have answers and more biological answers and more um, research and good practice articles there. Certainly in, in the UK we've got good practice guidelines for health practitioners and we will put up resources there on FGM workbooks and bits and pieces that as we produce them. Also we have country reports on certainly six East African countries at the moment. We've just started in Sierra Leone and Mali. Mm. So as we put those up of the 28 countries we do that one report every three months that we're completing the map. Yeah. And therefore you can find out about the indigenous people of those populations and also good practice examples of how this practice can be ended. One of the things being an alternative rite of passage, for instance, where a girl has the practice and all the all the knowledge passed on by her grouping, but not her hmm. part. Sure, Anna Maria, it's a very difficult issue for a guy to talk about, hmm. but I think it's important for us guys also to yeah. to be educated and to stand together on this issue mm -hmm. and to to stand, um, yeah, and and play our role. Thank you so much for <laughs> for it's been such a um, privilege of getting to know you a bit, um, but thanks for, for your time. Well, I think just actually talking about these things mm. and finding that it's not a taboo to talk about these embarrassing no. subjects is a start, and I would love that all the men in South Africa are as broad-minded as you and talk about this so comfortably. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, <laughs>